Every day, traders and investors dive in to tackle the ever-changing markets to find opportunity. Futures Radio Show is your number one source for answers to the questions that all market participants want to ask. Veteran futures trader Anthony Crudelli sits down with the most influential leaders and top traders in the industry. Now, here's your host, Anthony Crudelli. What's up, everybody? Anthony Crudelli here, and thank you for tuning in for this episode with George Perks. Futures Radio Show is sponsored by CME Group. They are the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world effectively manage risk. For access to free educational tools and resources for the active individual trader, please visit activetrader.cmegroup.com. Remember, new shows are posted on Mondays and Thursdays. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, YouTube, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. If you're enjoying the show, please leave a review on iTunes. This show is also sponsored by Trading Technologies, FTSE Russell, and RJO Futures. To learn about some great offers that these sponsors have for our listeners, please visit futuresradioshow.com slash sponsors. Today, I spoke with the global macro strategist at Bespoke Investment Group, George Perks. As two Duke fans, we kicked off today's show with a quick chat about how we thought Duke would have done in the NCAA tournament. And then we quickly got into why George has been using the hashtag MFTC, which stands for mail the checks to everyone in the U.S. as soon as possible. We discussed credit markets, and George explains why we are seeing the lack of liquidity in the bond markets. He gives us his thoughts on what the Fed has done thus far dealing with COVID-19's impact on the economy. We talked about market volatility and the VIX, and why George believes that crude oil wouldn't have gone to $20 if it wasn't for the coronavirus. And last but not least, George tells us that we will see a 1 million plus jobless claims number next week. And he gives us his thoughts on many other data points in the week ahead. So without further ado, let me take you right to the interview with George. George, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. It's great to have you back on the show, George. It's been a long time. I actually looked at when you were last on the podcast and it was June of 2016. So before we get into a lot of topics today... Can you just give everybody a quick background on yourself so they could familiarize themselves with you and and so they know really where you're coming from when we talk about a lot of these topics we're going to discuss today? Sure. Uh, so I attended Duke University, uh, majored in public policy studies. Um, so I don't come from an academic finance or strictly economics background, which I think is probably more common uh, with a lot of people in the financial industry. Um, these days. So um, graduated in 2012, uh, worked for B of A Merrill um, for a couple years, uh, doing a variety of things related to short-term fixed income and clearing, um, and ended up uh, moving over to Bespoke Investment Group at the start of 2014, and I've been there since. Um, I'm our global macro strategist, which means I basically have to keep track of what's going on in markets across assets and around the world and how that how they relate to economics public policy um and everything in between so um yeah it's a it's a fun seat and i get to talk a lot about a lot of interesting things and talk to some interesting people like yourself yeah well thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today and you know, before I even get into the topics, I have to talk about Duke this year because I'm a huge Duke fan too. I've been a huge fan of Coach K for many, many years, you know, Chicago guy. <laughs> what do you think would have happened with us this year with the Duke season? Well, you know, my, my thing with Duke basketball, and I'll be perfectly honest with you, because I was actually a, a Duke football player, I, I tend to care a little bit more about the football team than the basketball team. But whenever the basketball team is ranked highly, I get real nervous and I don't like it. Whenever the basketball team loses, loses a couple games in January, I start to get real excited because that means Coach K is going to get them right when it when they need to be right to win a national championship or at least to take a deep shot at it and who knows what would have been with the NCAA tournament being canceled but you know 
if it if it hadn't been, I mean, this is the kind of Duke team that would come in with a fire in its belly in a way that you know guys that had been blown folks out all year long just just don't do, and that really ultimately ends up hurting you at tournament time. So uh, it's too bad, but um, I am glad they canceled the tournament because it would have put a lot of people at risk to carry it, to to conduct it in this uh, set of circumstances we're stuck with here. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. It was the right thing to do. And I'm totally with you. And when people come into the tournament underestimating Duke is when they shine. You know, it's one of those teams where you can't name a lot of the players and all of a sudden they come in and, 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 and they win the thing. But uh, like I said, a, a lot of things to talk about today. We've all been tweeting quite a bit lately. So I like going through my guests' Twitter streams to, to see some of the things that they're talking about and something that you've been talking about quite a bit lately is just going to start off with this hashtag you've been putting out M T F C talk to us about this. Yeah. So, uh, it's really pretty simple. It's a very simple idea. It's mail the expletive checks, mail the checks, get cash in people's hands. Um, so, you know, I'm sure everyone knows, uh, you know, I think we're recording this podcast a couple of days before it's due to come out, but uh, every indication is that the economy of the United States and the global economy more broadly uh, hit an absolute brick wall in March at full speed. And uh, we're in a situation where jobs claims uh, for the week ending March 21st um, are probably going to come in over one million, um, which would be the highest print ever. Um We've got restaurant industry essentially shuttered in most of the country. Um, we've got massive declines in demand for basic consumer services and goods that have basic, you know, that are sort of part of the background of American life, whether it's cars, concerts, cruises, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, we, the economy is completely just smashed by the coronavirus and in some cases intentionally because a lot of economic activity is obviously uh, something that brings you into contact with other people often in large groups and that's the worst case scenario for spreading uh, COVID-19 and so you know we've essentially decided we're going to destroy the economy in order to prevent a lot of people from dying and that's a great decision as far as the policy side of it goes Um, but it still sucks for the economy and so the question is how do we make sure that people out of this experience, you know, when we climb out of our proverbial bunkers um, in Q2 at some point, hopefully, uh, and, you know, try and resume normal life, like how, what happens then? Um, and the best way to do this, um, in my opinion, and I think a lot of economic experts agree with this, and um, hopefully we can get Congress eventually on the same page with this, is the idea that people should just have checks sent to them. Um, every man, woman, child, and you know, every everybody in the country should have a check of some size sent to them. Um, there is a lot of disagreement over how big those checks should be, over whether they should be mean tested, over whether they should be um, clawed back at some future date, over whatever, you know, any number of different nitty gritty details. Uh, my view is there's almost no risk to going way too big with it. So might as well send it to as many people as you possibly can um, and avoid um, you know, any confusion over eligibility and just get checks out the door. And what that'll do, um, is essentially when, you know, right now people can't spend much, you know, you can go to your local Walmart or you can go to your local grocery store, but beyond that, there's not really a lot to spend on maybe Amazon, something like that, but you know, you can't go out and buy a car, whatever, but your rent still due. Um, some places have declared rent moratoriums, but generally speaking, rent is still due. Mortgage payments still do. Car payments still do, insurance is still do, yada yada yada. So if people are, if we have a million people thrown out of their jobs this week, um, you know, sending them thousands of dollars and literally thousands of dollars per person uh, is going to do a lot to forestall some of the worst outcomes that come with economic declines and income declines. Um, basically, what we saw in 2008, instead of taking place over 14 months, taking place over three months. Uh, we want to avoid that at, at you know, all costs essentially. Uh, so the idea is mail checks, get people cash in their hand and, um, you know, do the best we can to bounce back as fast as possible from the massive recession we're currently experiencing. Um, and hopefully that will, you know, hurt as few people as possible. So I have several questions about this. Um, first, the first question would be, do you put like an income cap on the people that would get checks? Like for someone like me, I, I, would, I would just say, I, would. I don't even want the check. I would say, give it to somebody that, that needs it. 
Like, you know, how, how would yeah. that work? So it depends on how you view, um, like, like, I guess if, if you view cash dispersed by the federal government as something that there's like a, 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 f a limited supply of, right? Um, if we were on the gold standard and our money supply was controlled by the pace we could mine gold, um, then yeah, I, I don't know. I might have a, I'm, I might agree with you. I don't know. I have to, I'd have to think about it more, more deeply. Um, I probably wouldn't be advocating that this policy in that instance, but, um, because we live in a fiat currency system where we have absolute monetary sovereignty in this country, um, you know, there is no, uh, downside to running a government budget deficit, um, to deploying government resources, to purchase goods and services, unless inflation gets out of control. Inflation is the opposite of out of control right now and has been for my entire adult life and will be for the foreseeable future. Um, so the downside to just literally printing money, um, mailing checks is negligible. And so in that instance, yeah, I mean, I don't need a check. Um, and you know, and I, I'm, I'm sure you don't either. And I'm sure there's lots of people that don't need checks, but, uh, if we try and create a program that's complicated, that is not something that every American gets to participate at once. Um, that is not something that literally could be written on the back of a napkin. Um, that just creates further risk in terms of getting it done quickly. Like speed is the most important thing here. Um, we should be sending people checks this week. It's going to be a month at best. Um, and so, you know, the, the key thing is getting money in people's hands. And, you know, if, if, that means you quote unquote waste some money on people that don't actually need it. Well, that's fine. Um, if the, if the downside, if the, if the benefit to that is, well, we got the money into the hands of the people that really needed it and we're sure of that. And also, you know, we did it really quickly. Then that's a, per there's, I don't see a trade off there. That's worth, that's worth even thinking about, let alone actually acting on. Interesting. I see what you're saying. So you think because of the situation, the speed is more important, which I would agree with you that speed is important in this type of situation that just give it to everybody. And I guess essentially almost, I mean, maybe they could create like a tiered system to it quickly. I don't, I don't know if they could do that or, or not, but the bottom line for you, speed is what's required here. Speed and size, right? And size. You need, yeah, you need like, and we're not talking like a hundred dollars here. We're talking like a thousand plus dollars. Um, monthly. And if you want a one, one time lump sum payment, it's probably going to be more like $2,000, $3,000. Um, yeah, like it's, it's, I, and, and that sounds like really over the top and kind of crazy because we're sort of used to this environment where everything's fine and like the economic expansion's grinding along and unemployment's falling and, you know, GDP is growing slowly, but it's ticking along and like we don't need this, you know, big dramatic thing to happen for any reason because the economy doesn't just doesn't need dramatic action right now. And, you know, I, I mean, I, that's certainly the consensus with how things have been for the, for the past, I don't know, decade or so now. Um, that is no longer the case. I was, I mean, and, and listeners can go back and listen to my interview in 2016 if they want examples or, um, look to other appearances I've done over the years and talked about my view on stuff. And, you know, I was absolutely the most sort of sanguine and, you know, the economy is in great shape, you know, things are going to keep grinding along. And that was the case until like mid February, late February of 2020. And then that's coronavirus. And the shock that is currently working its way through the economic and financial systems that sort of dictate how our society is set up is way, way more intense than what we saw in 2008. And it's not to say that that means we're going to have a recession as bad as 2008. I don't think that's written in stone yet. Um, but the speed combined with the size is totally unprecedented for a modern financialized services based economy. And it's so, so important that we don't let that metastasize into a broader recession because recessions are just disasters for people that have to endure them um, in terms of everything from suicide rates to lifetime earnings to, you know, uh, how people view the world for the rest of their lives. If they enter the labor market in a recession, um, if they catastrophically lose their job and have to leave their home in a recession, you know, these sorts of things are the worst things that you can do to someone's long, long-term well-being, economic well-being. Um, and we really, 
a lot of people are about to be in that circumstance and it's not their fault and it's not the fault of any one American. It's just something that's happened. And so the solution that, that we, that we propose, and I'm not the only one to have this view. This is actually quite a popular view among a certain set of policy oriented people is mail checks to people, give people cash so they can get through the next few months and come out ready to spend, ready to go work, ready to go make their mortgage payments, ready to go make their rent payments. And that we have as little economic disruption as possible. You make a lot of great points with that. And, and I guess the next question I would have is, what about the businesses that are struggling? Uh, what do we do for them? I mean, and, and not necessarily, you know, the big cruise lines and the airlines. We all know those are going to be hurting the hotels. What about the small businesses? Does this take care of that as well? Or how does that work? Yeah, so I, I, I think the the businesses are a little more complicated. I, I mean, I think to me, the most important thing is that we make sure that everyone has the, the means to get through the next few months. And if you're a small business person and your business is essentially coming apart at the seams because you own a restaurant and you're not allowed to open anymore, or you own a nightclub that can't have patrons or whatever, right? Um, there's any number of different businesses like that. Um, if you're one of these people, then, you know, a check helps you too, right? You get a check too. <laughs> you get to make your mortgage payment with that or get to make your rent payment or get to keep food on the table for your family. Whatever it is you think you need, you have the cash to do that or at least some cash to do that. Um, so that absolutely is part of it. You know, small business owners um, are – they're, they're – closer to wage labor than, you know, passive investors in businesses. Um, and, you know, so, so mailing checks to people that are, you know, the owner operator of small businesses is something that we can do to help relieve their pain and suffering because they will have pain and suffering as well as workers. Um, you know, and, and that's important. Um, there are a wide range of other ways we could alleviate pain for small businesses that are specifically impacted. So I think the restaurant sector is probably the best example of this because there is a specific economic shock that is not something they can control. Right now, I live in Charlotte, North Carolina, and you are not allowed to operate a restaurant in Charlotte, North Carolina right now. You cannot have sit-down patrons. You can bring food to people and hand it through their car door window to them on the curb. And I did that last night uh, with uh, Soul Food Gastro Lounge, and it was great. And I was super happy to support them. Um, but, you know, they can't have patrons. And I asked the guy, how is it? Well, it's not as good as having patrons, but – we can keep the doors open. So, you know, whether that's small business loans um, without interest, whether that's direct cash subsidies of some some kind, um, you know, I think there's there's a case to be made for that. Um, you know, to me, the most important thing is making people have the, making sure people have the means and resources over the next few months to figure it out. And if restaurants go bankrupt in the meantime, you know, you know, three months, six months down the road, you know, that probably isn't the end of the world. Um, because in if we make if we do a good job in making sure that demand is sustained, making sure that people have income to spend at restaurants, then restaurants will come back after this shock. Um, so, you know, that I think that's the biggest thing. Um, but in general, if we are going to, you know, let small businesses fail, let restaurants fail, let large businesses fail. We need to make sure that the people that are affected by that, whether they're workers, owners, operators, whoever, um, have the support to meet their basic basic needs that they need. Um, and again, just to reiterate, in my view, the best way to do that is to mail checks to people, MTFC. Hey everybody, a quick pause here to talk about FTSE Russell. They are a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. The Russell 2000 Index is a key benchmark for small cap US stocks. Be sure to check out the E-mini Russell 2000 Index Futures Contract symbol R T Y for more information on footsie Russell and their products, please visit footsie Russell.com. And to me, it just sounds very similar to what Mark Dow, uh, he was the last guest I had on the show and he was just like, Anthony, right now we just need time. And to me, because this is all about the coronavirus and we know it's going to end at some time, is this the reason why you believe this is the best plan for this type of scenario is just to give people comfort through this? Is that really why you think uh, this is the plan is just to, to buy time through this? Yeah. I mean, I, I think I would, I would quote from my, uh, my 
friend and colleague Nathan Tankus, um, his quote about this is what we really want to do here is cover the overhead costs of households. Right. Um, we do not have the macroeconomic policy levers to make sure that every every business that we like stays open or every you know worker that we want to have a job continues to have a job. Um, but what we can do is we can sort of do our best to support aggregate demand uh, when aggregate demand is ready to be unfurled. Right. When we take the uh, restrictions off as a result of COVID-19. There is no question that this shock, this, you know, aggregate demand shock from the virus is entirely from the virus. There is no other reason. The economy was really about to turn a corner and accelerate hard in January and February of this year. Without this virus right now, you know, we're talking about a 10 you know, year treasury that's at two and a half percent. And the Fed maybe needs to hike a couple times this year, even though they've said they won't do it until core PC is over two percent because the economy is really ripping. Um, that's where we would have been. The reason we're not there is not because of any one person, right, or any one set of institutions or any one, you know, there, it, it, it's something that's beyond the control of any economic agent. Um, that wasn't true in 2008, 2009, or right? 2007, 2009, right? That, that, that credit had built up in terms of, um, you know, borrowing by households, borrowing by business, and, you know, primarily households. Um, banks had gotten overextended. Leverage was really high. Like, there were, there were, benefits accrued by people throughout that whole process right um and so when you're talking about bailing out businesses that had had, had a hand in creating that mess you're talking about a sort of different set of 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 incentives than you are with regards to the coronavirus with the coronavirus there's there's no reasonable prudent step that anyone could have taken to prevent what's happening right now any one person certainly not a restaurant in you know charlotte right like there's the, nobody out there is going to sell you an insurance policy that covers a 100 percent decline in your revenues. Um, that's just not going to happen. So, you know, um, in that instance, like that's what we have a federal government for. That's why that's what we have collective institutions for is to step in and say, look, this wasn't anyone's fault and we need to do our best to make our way through it. And, you know, uh, whether that involves mailing checks, organizing relief efforts um, for specific cities like the federal government's doing for San Francisco and New York, um, whether that involves um, marshalling the various resources at hand um, to, you know, better spread around the weight of what the country's medical system is about to bear. Um, you know, there's all sorts of things that, that we have a collective instead of institutions for. One of those things is to make sure that when it comes time to come out of it, that people are ready to come out of it with cash in their hands. Um, and, you know, that that to me is, is the single most important thing, because if we sustain aggregate demand, then the opportunities that allowed restaurants to be open in the first place will still exist, that allowed cruise lines or airlines or whoever to exist in the first place. Those will still be there. Um, and the question is, um, you know, maybe they aren't, maybe you have the exact same set of aggregate demand. Um, you know, maybe people want more delivery than, than, um, they wanted, you know, sit down dining previously. It's still aggregate demand that can be met by businesses and, you know, um, allow opportunities in new, in new ways. Um, so as long as we make sure that people are ready to, you know, guns blazing, come out of this, ready to spend, ready to consume as they were before, uh, we're going to be in, in okay shape. I want to move on about and talk about something else that you tweeted and you said, literally everything I'm hearing from people trading munis, MBS, CMBS, commercial paper credit suggests that things are as bad as they can get and nothing is going to change until two things you wrote. The Fed block bids stuff in size and two, PDCF gets full capital and leverage requirement relief. Yeah. So right now in fixed income markets and you know, credit markets is probably the easiest way to say it. It's not just credit because it's taking place in places that aren't really considered credit in certain spheres. Um, so for instance, uh, mortgage backed security pools, it's as simple as mortgage bonds get. It's a pool of mortgages that pays out over 30 years. Um, it gets bid relative to bonds, um, uh, because it's a, interest rate product. Um, it's fully guaranteed by the government in terms of principal and interest. Um, 
it's a pool of loans. So those uh, today uh, were trading 180 basis points over treasuries. Um, so almost two percentage points over treasuries for context. They usually trade 50 basis points over treasuries, something like that. I mean, they trade, they trade in a range, but, um, you know, 50 basis points would be a more normal spread for something like that. Uh, commercial paper issued by the highest quality issuers. So we're talking, you know, double a or at worst single a rated issuers in terms of long-term debt, uh, short term, a one P one, you know, top of the top of the cream of the crop in terms of quality of credit, um, issuing 30 day commercial paper and that, you know, 30 day commercial paper from those issuers is yielding two percentage points over treasuries, um, almost two percentage points over treasuries that just, you know, those are two examples of markets that are just broken. Like there's just, that is not a sort of informed view on the outlook for some asset, like the outlook for cash flows, um, the probability of good or bad things happening in the economy, whatever. It's not based on anything like that. It's just pure supply and demand panic selling and nobody there to buy um, in products that don't carry substantial credit risk that aren't, you know, this is not something where, oh, well, they might not make the payment. No, it's not. That's not what you're worried about. There's just no one to buy. Um, and the reason for that is because of flows within um, the fund system, um, both exchange trade products or so ETFs, fixed income ETFs, um, exchange trade notes, uh, leveraged exchange trade notes is in particular have been a problem this week. And um, also just withdrawals, general withdrawals and demands for liquidity in stuff like money market funds. Um, you know, I'm, I'm getting color from people who trade short term municipal debt for money market funds who are, you know, saying this is like there's just no there's just no bit like you just can't sell anything. And the reason you can't sell anything is because everyone's trying to sell something. Um, this is not purely a function of ETFs. Um, it's not purely a function of um, dealers carrying less inventory. It's not purely a function of any one fact. It's just everyone's rushing for the exits at once. And even paper that is money good that you do not need to worry about a default on, um, you just can't sell. And I mean, we even saw it in treasuries, honestly, over the past week. So we're recording this uh Thursday of, uh, you know, Thursday, March 19th and yields dropped today, but man, they had been going up for a week in aggressive fashion. And so the solution to this in, in, in my opinion, and talking to people that are in these markets, um, treasuries, MBS, munis across the board, um, the solution is twofold. The first thing that can be done is the fed needs to start buying like in size. And now, uh, they need to start taking treasuries off the balance sheets of dealers and replacing them with reserves. Um, so when the Fed is buying, they're conducting an asset swap. Uh, treasuries or mortgage-backed securities that they buy goes off of the private sector's balance sheet and onto the Fed's balance sheet. Uh, in return, the private sector is given reserves, uh, which are essentially the most liquid and safest possible um, income-generating asset you can own. Uh, they are only able to be held by banks, Banks must mathematically, because they're giving uh, cash to whoever originally owned the treasuries, bank deposits rise when reserves rise when the Fed conducts QE. So basically what you're doing is you're taking intermediate by banks, uh, treasuries from private sector non-banks. Those go to banks. The non-banks get a deposit. The banks then forward on the treasuries to dealers. Um, and get a reserve credit for the treasuries. The dealers take the treasuries, hand them to the Fed, and get a reserve credit from the Fed. So it's this flow of asset swaps. So that, and what it's doing is it's taking risk off of balance sheets. It's de-risking balance sheets. And so the Fed needs to do that. And the reason they need to do that is not because it'll have a huge economic impact directly, but because with fewer treasuries and mortgage-backed securities on their balance sheets, these institutions that facilitate liquidity in all sorts of different fixed income products, not just treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, all sorts of fixed income product, products, they will be able to then say, okay, we can take these reserves. We, we, our, our balance sheet has gone down in aggregate size because we've sold on treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. We can now go make markets and provide warehouse capabilities to other securities. And so um, that's the logic behind the QE um, side of the two things you identified from my tweet. The other side of this is uh, the primary dealer credit primary dealer credit facility. So 
basically, um, earlier this week, the Fed said any uh, uh, any primary dealers, so that's um, folks that participate in treasury auctions, primary dealers can come to us and post investment grade collateral um, as well as a range of other stuff um, that's higher quality than that to uh, this new facility we're creating. We will then offer a loan um, to the primary dealer based on that collateral. Um, we'll haircut the collateral. So for instance, if it's an investment grade bond, maybe they'll haircut it 10%. Um, I don't know, something like that. And so then we posted an investment grade government or investment grade bond. We get back 90 cents on the dollar in cash. We pay a 25 basis point interest rate on that. And we can go put that cash to work doing something else. Um, so basically the fed is offering to fund dealer balance sheets. It's offering to provide the cash necessary for these dealers to own bonds. The problem is that these dealers aren't constrained by funding markets, particularly funding markets in terms of repo, um, and in terms of short term credit, um, funding, wholesale funding. So commercial paper, for instance, um, has been rough, but that's not really the constraint for them. The constraint is their ability to, um, transact um, and hold these assets uh, without incurring massive capital cost um, in terms of um, regulation. So basically, when you hold a, a bond on your balance sheet instead of cash, uh, it's given a much harsher capital treatment. You have to hold more equity capital against it. Um, you have to have more equity, more dollars of equity capital for every dollar of investment grade government bond or investment grade bond that you hold in your balance sheet than um, if you were to just have that asset in cash instead of the, instead of the bond. So basically, dealers are unable to transact in these sort of um, markets uh, because they're unable to hold an inventory of securities in these markets because the capital cost of those securities is too high. Um, you know, this is not a full explanation of all the volatility we've seen, but it would help enormously if when dealers bought a bond from a customer, they could post it to the Fed and be able to fund it as currently is the case with the primary dealer credit facility, but not incur a capital cost on that bond, right? So instead of basically that what the Fed could do, and they had art, they've already done this with commercial paper because of a different facility they opened this week. What the Fed could do is they could say, if you post a bond to our credit facility, that is no longer part of your risk weighted assets calculation. It's assumed that you're good, that our haircut is sufficient, and that we don't have to worry about the value of that bond on your balance sheet. Um, obviously, this would be controversial. Um, but to me, it's a very good option to free up liquidity and get people trading bonds again and get people trading bonds again at realistic prices that can then be arbitraged towards fair value by the presence of this very cheap funding and without the artificial constraint, essentially imposed constraint of capital costs related to uh, the, the minimum capital that dealers have to hold against the various bonds they hold in their balance sheet. Okay, a couple of things. First, that um, was long. I'm it, sorry. That was no problem. <laughs> no problem. I mean, this is I'm learning so much and I'm the first to admit this is above my pay grade and 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 I've learned a lot from what you had just said and and my thoughts are as somebody who trades treasury futures from what a lot of what you're saying to me is the reason why we're seeing the lack of liquidity in bond and treasury futures. For sure. I mean, look, like like treasury futures have to be held in line, right, uh, with the fair value of the underlying, right? So how does a treasury future work? A treasury future is, you know, you the, the, the way it, the way it works on maturity is that a bond is delivered against the obligation of the future. If I'm short the future into mature into expiration, then I have to come up with a bond to deliver into the future. And obviously that bond um, doesn't have to be any specific QCIP. It doesn't have to be the current on the run treasury um, for the TY contract. Um, it's whatever's the cheapest bond to deliver in, which, which is based on a coupon calculation that that's kind of over the head of almost everyone that doesn't do this for a living. Um, but basically, like there's an there's a mechanism that anchors the treasury future to the actual treasury bond, right? That requires arbitrageurs. 
right? You have yes. to have somebody that's willing to buy the bond and sell the future or sell the future and buy the bond when those get out of line. And when they get unhinged and nobody has the balance sheet to be able to do that, then things are going to get pretty messy. And that's absolutely like we're totally seeing that. Um, in addition to just the fact that, you know, transacting risk is always going to require paying a bid ask spread. Um, and that bid ask spread has widened naturally, but also you've got massive problems with people trying to arbitrage treasuries towards their fair value in futures and cash across the entire fixed income market right now. You mentioned something that the fed could do that would be controversial. Could you explain to us why it would be? Well, I think that people would sort of see, um, you know, this idea of easing capital standards at a time when when the financial system is facing a lot of risk, I think people would see that as a big problem in terms of creating a situation where banks may uh, basically need get run into trouble and need to be bailed out because of the risk they're running. Um, I don't see that as the case. And there's a bunch of reasons for that. The primary one being that, you know, if you've got high enough capital going into stuff going wrong, then what you do once stuff starts going wrong, isn't really important, right? Like if you're going to have capital standards reduced, the best possible time to do that is when capital is very, very expensive, um, which is sort of the opposite of how it worked in 2000, in the 1990s and 2000s. In that period, you know, they were easing capital standards or um, certainly regulatory standards in general for the financial system as markets were doing well, right? As things were going really, really well. Um, the uh, repeal of Glass-Steagall, for instance, it separated commercial and um, investment banking. That happened during one of the longest equity bull markets in history. Um, you know, this time around post crisis, we were, we've been very, very good about making sure that banks just didn't go back to doing what they were doing in the two thousands. Um, not just the United States, but around the world, uh, capital ratios are much higher now, even in Europe where things have not gone as well economically as the United States. Um, capital ratios are much higher. Leverage is much lower. Um, banks are much less important as nexuses of funding risk um, than prior to the crisis. And so if there's ever going to be a time where you want banks to, you know, face lower standards, it's right now because the prices that would hurt banks capital have already moved. Right. If you want them to go start warehousing bonds that trade at 60 when those bonds were trading at 85 or 90 or 95 a month ago, you would way rather have them trading. You'd way rather have them doing that with relaxed capital standards when the bonds are trading at 60 than when the bonds are trading at 95, because the odds that the bond is now going to keep going down is just it's not as high as when the bond was at 95. Right. We know that. I mean, it's just a function of how prices work. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think it would be controversial. You know, people would probably be a, opposed to it in the sense that they would see this as making banks, making it easier on banks when we should be making it harder on banks because the financial system's messed up. The financial system is not messed up because of banks right now. It's not banks fault. I mean, it, you can blame banks for a lot, but right now <laughs> it's because of a combination of low liquidity. That's not something that banks introduced and this massive macro shock. And so, you know, um, I, I think it would be controversial to ease capital standards on banks in order to improve the uh, liquidity of the financial system and sort of push through. But I think it's something that um, if conducted in a targeted way, in a way that we know is going to be, you know, responsibly used because the Fed would have a say over the haircuts applied to capital posted at the uh, to, uh, assets posted at the primary dealer credit facility. And I, I think it makes sense to do it now, if ever. Hey, everybody, I want to take a quick pause and talk about RJO Futures. They are a longstanding brokerage firm with personal broker relationships to learn, discuss and trade the futures markets. To learn more about RJO Futures, please visit rjofutures.com. So much debate out there on what the Fed has done thus far by cutting rates. Some people say it's great to see the Fed stepping in, getting ahead of this. Other people are saying that the Fed shouldn't be doing anything right now. What are your thoughts on what the Fed has done thus far? Oh, cutting rates isn't going to turn around the economy. Um, as we've discussed, 
the shock is here and even mailing people checks isn't going to turn around economic growth. Um, what the Fed is trying to do is they're trying to do the same thing that mailing people checks would do. It, they're trying to make sure that when it, the all clear is sounded for economic activity to resume as quote unquote normal, that people aren't are able, you know, have the, the, the cash and financial resources to do that. And the best way the Fed can do that is by cutting rates. Uh, QE helps as well, but what's really important in terms of the, you know, at the margin is taking rates back to the zero lower bound. Um, I wrote an opinion piece last week uh, cheering the Fed for doing for, for cutting rates, for taking rates down in the first move. I'm a fan of what they've done in taking rates down to zero since. It's absolutely the right call. It will protect the financial system from – um, financial system and broader economy from even further shocks um, that would have built without them doing that. It will not solve the problem of the virus, but anybody that looks at you with a straight face and says the Fed shouldn't have cut rates because that will make things worse doesn't know what they're talking about. And anybody that says they shouldn't do it because it won't solve the virus problem also doesn't know what they're talking about. Because what the Fed's trying to do is not to solve the virus problem. They're trying to make sure that when it comes time to spend again, the consumers are equipped and funded to do so. And cutting rates is the best possible tool they have for that. What were your thoughts on the market reactions after the Fed cut the rates? Uh, well, I mean, first off, Treasuries did what you would expect them to do, right? They, the yields plunged. Um, they since have bounced back. Uh, people are attributing that to fiscal stimulus. I think that's wrong. I think it's because of the liquidity issues that's been going on uh, that we just spent uh, far too much of everyone's time talking about. Um, but no, I, I mean, I think judging the Fed uh, by what the stock market does in response to its decisions is a big mistake. Um, I think, you know, it's instructive um, that the market didn't react well to what the Fed proposed to do, um, you know, the, the market did not rip on the Fed cutting. Um, that's understandable when the marginal fl news flow last week and this week about uh, the global economy, about uh, the outlook for the number of people that are about to die in the United States because of this disease, uh, you know, when all that news flow is still very negative. Um, I, I don't know why people would assume that the Fed cut rates so stocks have to go up. Well, no. I mean, it, stocks don't always just care about the level of interest rates. There's other stuff going on. And there's other stuff that is going on that is going to have an existential threat to corporate profits. And in that instance, yeah, you, it, the Fed cutting rates didn't help. And I don't know why people would expect it to. Uh, but that doesn't mean they shouldn't have done it. A couple more things before we get into rapid fire. Um, I want to go back to your tweets and, and one of the things that you put out was really, it's really important to remember that unless we are seeing 5% plus moves regularly, it's super hard for vol to stay in the mid seventies for prolonged periods. For example, the series below, um, you put uh, a picture, a chart there, uh, and you said, it's not random. I know just bear with me. It has a realized annualized volatility, 20 points below the current VIX. I'll take that picture and put it in the post so people can see it or I'll embed that tweet in the post. But but just I thought that was a very important tweet and, and talk to us about that. Yeah, so just so people kind of have a, a feel for it. It's a, it's a series of 22 different days, right? You can imagine them as days. 3%, up 3%, down 3%, up 1%, down 5%, up 5%, down 1%, and then it repeats, right? So it's this series of sort of very, if you can imagine the stock market going up 3%, down 3%, up 1%, down 5%, up 5%, down 1%. I mean, that's, that's a lot of volatility, right? That's similar to the period we're in right now. So that series had an annualized volatility of, I think, 55%. Um, so the, the volatility, you know, in, in mathematical terms, what is that? The, 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 the annualized volatility is the square root of percentage return or sorry, the standard deviation of percentage returns multiplied by the square root of 252. Um, and what that essentially is telling you is a mathematical formula for how much the market is moving. The VIX index is a measure. It's not strictly speaking um, implied volatility in the Black-Scholes formula for um, for American options, but it's best thought of thought as thought of in that way. Um, so essentially, with the VIX in the 70s, what you're talking about is an implied volatility 
that is 20 points above the series I just described. That's sort of the implication. Um, it doesn't take long for volatility to be much lower than the VIX and for the VIX to be far too high um, relative to quote unquote fair value for where volatility is at, um, you know, for the VIX to start getting dragged down. We started seeing that today. So the VIX had tagged 82 the last three days before today, I think. Again, we're recording on Thursday the 19th. Um, and today, I mean, it just got smoked across the course of the session and stuff had rallied, but stocks were not up huge today. Right. Um, and so, uh, that huge decline in volatility is just because we're not seeing three, four, 5% moves every day. If you're seeing three, four, 5% moves every day, yeah, volatility can be in, you know, 80% range. Um, and that applies to the VIX or realized volatility. If you're seeing, 1% moves, 3% moves, 2% moves as sort of part of the standard toolkit of where markets are trading, well, then volatility can't stay in the 80s for long. It just can't because that means either option buyers are paying a persistent um, extreme premium over the over where the realized volatility has been. Um, I mean, that, that's the only explanation for, for why volatility could stay that high. Um, and, you know, that can happen from day to day, but for sustained periods, for like a, a period of a week or more, you can't pay 20 points above realized vol. You just, it, you're, you're going to get incinerated in terms of P&L. There's just only so much cash you can throw after that strategy. Um, and so, you know, what, what's going to end up happening is as the market stops dropping 5% a day, then VIX me mechanically has to come down. And so we've started to see that process. Um, you know, VIX in the 50s is not that much different from VIX in the 80s in terms of like what it implies about how much the market's moving, um, you know, and how stressed the financial system is. Uh, but it is different. And so as just, you know, if you're trading VIX products, if you're, you know, whether it's ETNs, ETFs, uh, the futures themselves, um, whatever, if you're trading vol products, just remember that if you're not seeing 5% days, you can't see an 80 VIX. And if you're not seeing 3% days, then you can't really see a 50 VIX. Um, and so that doesn't mean the market's about to rip or that stocks have made a bottom. It just means that you have to continue seeing big percentage moves for VIX to stay where it has been the past couple of weeks. Another thing I want to talk about is crude oil. I mean, I think that obviously you take the coronavirus off the table. This is the most talked about topic right now. I don't even know what the recent low in crude was. It was I know it was in the low 20s. I mean, we know that the Saudis and the Russians are increasing output. And, you know, I, I kind of, from all the people that I read, you know, some people are saying this is a really big deal. Other people are saying, well, it's it's not that big of a deal. What are your thoughts on what's happening in crude oil? Uh, yeah, I mean, so the low, I think we got to trade at 20, almost 20 of the figure. No, lower than that. Um, 20 spot 06 uh, on March 18th, which was yesterday, was yeah, uh, okay. Wednesday. Yeah. Uh, so that's for front month WTI, obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's an absolute catastrophe for a, a, an asset that was trading at sixty dollars in at the end of last year i mean that's that's crazy i mean that's i don't i don't even know how to, I, I don't think i can overstate it um i absolutely agree with you that if oil was at 20 right now or 20 it closed at what 23 24 25 dollars something like that today uh if oil right now was at these levels without coronavirus for sure it'd be the biggest story but it wouldn't be and it wouldn't be at these levels. And here's why. Okay. Oil is suffering a combined supply shock and demand glut or sorry, demand shock and supply glut at the same time. The Saudi decision to ramp up production was undertaken because we are in a position of extreme demand shock. So the decline in not just jet fuel, but driving, um, you know, all sorts of demand in terms of chemicals, um, petroleum products, heating across the board, just massive decline in demand for crude that you're going to see in a much slower economy and in a economy, global economy restricted by COVID. That created a door for um, 
Mohammed bin Salman to walk through. And that created an opportunity for him to really squeeze producers um, in the United States and the rest of the world in ways that he wouldn't be able to on his own without um, that demand shock at the same time. The Saudis know that they can weather a very severe demand and supply shock that takes oil down to roughly their cost of production, um, which is give or take $20. It's maybe a bit below that close enough called 20. They know they can, they can take oil to 20 and survive for a year. They're not worried about that. They don't think that the, the Texas oil patch can do that. And they wouldn't think that the Texas oil patch could do that if they were talking about taking oil to 40 instead of 20. But because of the demand shock, they saw an opportunity to not just go for a TKO, but completely knock out shale producers and push them so far out of viability that the U.S. energy sector is no longer the world swing producer as it has been since roughly 2015. And that's exactly what's going to happen. Um, basically, you are not going to be able to produce new oil assets in this country for the foreseeable future because almost nobody has a break even as low as the Saudis do. That almost nobody in the U.S. has a break even below thirty dollars. It's scale. Um, it's just break evens are higher than that, and so you know, let alone you know, that's production break even, let alone new capex break even on top of new capex plus the cost of capital to your shareholders and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah. I, I, I totally agree that if oil was at 20 without COVID-19, that that it would be a massive story. And it would be the only thing people talked about. Without COVID-19, oil would not be below 50. Um, and so, you know, we would be still in that sort of uneasy equilibrium between OPEC plus and the Texas oil patch, uh, that has operated for the past three or four years. And, um, you know, I, I don't see any reason that that, that would have broken. I mean, if anything, you would be you know, oil might be trading significantly higher because of stronger global economic growth that was looking to kick in um, in the economic data we've seen from December, January, February before China shut down and COVID jumped across the Pacific and into Europe. What do you think this ultimately means for the U.S. economy? What's happening with crude oil? Well, we're going to pump a lot less crude oil. Uh, in the United States, for sure. Uh, job losses in Texas have largely fed through since 2014, 2015 already, and other oil producing states. I mean, the, the, the job counts were quite steep in terms of their reductions um, following the, the first leg down in, in crude oil prices um, from 2014 through 2016. Uh, there has been some bounce back, obviously. Uh, but yeah, I mean, right now, there is very little oil being pumped anywhere in the United States that is economically viable at these prices. And so CapEx is gone. There will be no more oil CapEx. I mean, there will be maintenance CapEx on trans, excuse me, on oil transportation and oil refining assets for sure. And, you know, oil that's already flowing out of um, both conventional and tight oil plays will continue to flow. There's no reason to shut those off. Uh, but new wells will not get drilled. I mean, it, it'll essentially go to zero until oil gets back to around $50. And when it does, it'll be at a much smaller scale. So, you know, the U.S. was a net petroleum exporter for a few months. Um, and there may be a chance we return to that in the future um, on a sustained basis. But for the foreseeable future, you know, the U.S. petroleum trade deficit will expand again because there just won't be enough domestic production. Um, and, you know, the, the shale revolution that has operated that basically took the U.S. from the world's largest net importer to a net exporter um, will be over. Now, down the road, um, you know, shale's not going away. That technology is not going to go away. So there will still be shale producers, just nowhere near as much scale as we've seen um, since 2013, really. Um, and yeah, um, I think that's very sad for people um, who work in the oil patch and um, who've relied on that sector for their uh, living. Um, but it's just another reason to mail the checks. So we talked about a lot today. I mean, really, uh, you gave me a, a great education as to what's going on. I'm, I'm still digesting all of it. And I was just writing notes throughout, and you had mentioned that you think that jobless claims is going to reach as high as a million. Is that I right? would be 
Yeah, I would be very surprised. So, th- so again, we're recording this on March 19th. So this is Thursday, March 19th, and we got um, jobless ca- claims for the week ended March 14th. So the week over week change in jobless claims this week um, was uh, 70,000. So 281,000 claims was 70,000 higher than the 211,000 from last week. Um, that puts it into the top 15 or 20 weeks all time. Um, going back to 1967, uh, 13 other weeks um, had higher increases. So 281,000 what we saw this week. We are tracking based on Google Trends data and based on preliminary reports from departments of labor around the country. I've, I've seen data from 13 different states for at least one day of the week um, for the reporting week and March 21st. So that will be reported on uh, March 26th, Thursday, March 26th. Uh, yeah, a million claims. Uh, looks probable, if not locked in. Um, and so you can imagine what that's going to do to psychology when we go from 211,000 to a million in two weeks. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. That's why I was saying, I mean, hearing that number, the what I want to talk about the last thing before we get into rapid fire is, is really psychologically prepare us for some of the data points coming up on how you see them coming out brace us for some of the things that you're already preparing to see so anything that's got a february on it just ignore right anything that's got a q4 january february december all that stuff just completely ignore it because it didn't have any impact that's from from covid19 that is now you know driving the whole economy as far as upcoming releases, um, so um, for the week of March uh, 24th, 23rd, um, so market PMIs are on the morning of March 24th, so it's Tuesday morning. Um, prelim PMIs are expected to be 45 for manufacturing, 44 for services for the month of March. I'll be surprised if those are in the 30s. I think we could see 20 prints on those. Um you know, they could be in the 30s. There's no way they're going to be in the mid 40s. I just don't believe it. Uh, restaurant traffic in the United States right now is down 91 percent year over year, and it's going to go lower than that. Um, all large events have been canceled for about a week and a half now for mo- for large swaths of the country. I mean, it's just going to be it's going to be brutal. Um, so that's Tuesday. Uh, new home sales for February is also on Tuesday. That can be ignored. Richmond Fed manufacturing. Um, That'll be bad. I mean, we had the largest ever drop in the Philly Fed. That's back to the 1960s today as far as the headline index. So change from prior month to current month, um, largest ever drop. Richmond Fed will be similar. Durable goods, uh, prelim for February is on next Wednesday. You can ignore that. Uh, Advanced good trade balance for February is on Thursday. Ignore that. Wholesale inventory for February, ignore that. GDP for Q4, definitely ignore that. And that brings us to initial claims. Um, so that's the big one. I mean, I I really do think, you know, we saw 281K this week. I think we'll see a million next week. Um, and that has upside to like the mid, mid like like 1.5 um, if it's really bad. Now, I'm not sure it will be, but it's got potential to do that. Um, hopefully, you, your listeners listen to this and, you know, fast forward to Thursday and that number comes out and it's like 800,000. They go, what was that Perks guy talking about? What's even close to a million? Uh, that'd be great because it would mean that uh, the economy is in much less bad shape than we thought it was. Uh, and I hope for that outcome. But I, I, I just the data suggests it's going to be north of a million. It's going to be grim. Um, and then the rest of the data for the week, it looks like uh, is going to be monthly. Um, University of Michigan sentiment on Friday. Pre, uh, final for March. That'll drop from the prelim. The prelim was ninety was ninety five nine. Uh, that'll that'll drop. That could drop to eight. Uh, that could drop to the mid eighties. We'll see. Um, but yeah, that that's going to be rough. And then after that, the week's done. So that's it. I know that none of us are in the business of of guessing where where this bottom comes. Um, it comes when it comes. But for you on the macro side, what are some signs that you would be looking at to say, you know what? The worst is behind us. Some sort of visibility into into a slowdown in new cases in the U.S. Um, the the current, if you look at Italy as the trend lines, um, we will be reporting thousands of new cases a day for 
several weeks to come. Um, there is potential just because of how the U.S. is set up and because of how our response has been so far, there is potential for that number to be tens of thousands for weeks to come, um, you know, possibly months, right? Um, so until the market either by analog from another country or through the actual just peak and decline of U.S. confirmed positive COVID-19 cases, until the market can get comfortable with that, uh, I, I don't see how equities have a material and sustained bottom. Um, we may get a, a, a tactical bottom that lasts for a week or two, uh, and I definitely think volatility will decline substantially, but a grinding bear market can continue for a lot longer. And I think that's sort of what we'll transition into until people start to get visibility that, okay, U.S. case, the, the number of U.S. cases per day has peaked and we're going to start to decelerate because we've sort of got this thing under control. Um, there is no reason to think that's coming anytime soon uh, based on any of the analogs or how the U.S. has reacted so far or anything like that. So um, I don't see a, a bottom for equities for a while to come yet. Yeah, sadly, I, sadly, I feel the exact same way. Um, yeah. But great stuff today. All I could say is, wow, I learned a lot. But we are not done yet. I have rapid fire questions next if you're ready for those. Yeah, hit me with them. All right, everybody. Our rapid fire segment is sponsored by Trading Technologies. Trade the global markets with TT. They are the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. Now with integrated tools for advanced options trading, cryptocurrencies, and trade surveillance. You can try it now for free at tryttnow.com. George, first question for you. What trader has influenced your life the most and why? Without doubt, uh, a gentleman by the name of Lance O'Brien, uh, I doubt he'll hear this, but I'll flag it to him so he can hopefully hear me shout him out here. Lance was one of my mentors at B of A Merrill. Um, and actually, after I got fired uh, in October of 2013 from my first job on Wall Street at, at B of A, uh, Lance kept in touch and he, he kept an eye on what was going on Twitter on, on Twitter through his uh, Bloomberg terminal. And I got an email from him cold one day saying, hey, you should submit your resume to this. And it was a, it was a tweet from my current employer, Bespoke Investment Group. And Lance uh, you know, had sent me the tweet. I had my resume in their inbox within half an hour of them sending the tweet. Um, and uh, the rest was uh, history, as it were. And so I really I owe my uh, spot, my seat today and, and my career today to Lance in a lot of ways. And uh, I hope he hears it so he can hear me say, thanks, man. You, you did me solid and I really appreciate it. What was one of the hardest things for you to overcome covering financial markets? Uh, well, actually, just to, to, to riff off of that story I just gave, I mean, getting fired out of my first job on the street sucked. Uh, 24 and staring down the barrel of declaring personal bankruptcy and, you know, um, putting three months in Manhattan on a credit card. Uh, that sucked. But uh, it worked out. Um, I'm very lucky and, um, you know, I'm, I'm really happy with, with how things ended up working out. Um, and I think that's a good lesson on adversity and, you know, what you can take away from it even when things are looking pretty dark. How has your process for covering financial markets evolved over the years? I think I trust myself a lot more now to understand how things work um, and not necessarily need other people to validate that perspective. Um, I'm perfectly happy to you know, talk about stuff related to financial markets and have someone say, well, you're, you're dead wrong and just say, okay, well, whatever, and move on. Um, without having to sort of defer to, to them, um, on, on a lot of stuff. And, you know, I've always been a pretty headstrong guy, I think. <laughs> um, so it's not like a super big surprise, but I think just the confidence of, of understanding how things work, um, and seeing sort of, um, my knowledge base expand over time. I, I mean, I think that's, that's, that's the biggest change for me. Um, yeah. What is one attribute you believe every trader should have? Uh, knowing when you're beaten, um, honestly, I mean, I, I think the, like the best traders in the world, um, are going to hit six times for every four they miss, you know, probably not that much. It's probably more like 55, 45. Um, and so, you know, you're going to lose a lot. Like there, there are no, you know, 15 and one seasons in, in any kind of trading, whether it's at very high frequency day trading, whether it's, you know, 
folks that are doing longer term investing, whatever, like you're never going to go 15 and one. You're hoping to go nine and seven. And, you know, the, the key to, to winning as a trader is not is not running up the the record. It's having a high point differential. Every time you win, winning by a lot, and every time you lose, only losing by a little bit. That is what is going to create income and create a career for people over the long term, um, because you just cannot be right all the time. It's just not how the world works. It's not how financial markets work. What you can do is take advantage of um, you know uh, the situations that or the 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 um, the opportunities that develop and and press them for for what they're worth and when opportunities are developing just not being afraid to step back and say i can't win that's it i'm done favorite book about trading Hmm. i don't think it's necessarily about trading but I think my favorite book about financial markets is probably when genius failed. And I think we're going through the sort of moment that the folks who rode long-term capital management into the ground in the late 1990s sort of went through. Um, and I think understanding that environment and understanding how out of control those markets got, um, as well as sort of seeing some of that when I was a little bit younger than I am today in the, in the financial crisis and understanding some of the, the, the roots of that phenomenally useful, um, for sure. Um, so I think, I think if there was one book I had to, uh, I had to pick, it would probably be when genius failed, but it's not strictly speaking about trading. It's more about financial markets. What's the best piece of advice that you received about trading? I don't, I think, I think the way I would answer this is, is there's no, you know, there, there, there's no one p pe- like like trading and being around financial markets. Like you're never gonna. There's no one nugget of wisdom out there, right? Like I can say stuff that might help people, or I can hear stuff that might help me, or whatever. But you know, it's never gonna be one thing that just that's what works, that's what clicks. You know, um, so I think I think if you're gonna be really you know involved in in trading financial markets and if you're gonna be involved in forecasting and working around financial markets like you just have to always have your ears open to new pieces of information um, to new ideas um, you know to new opportunities in a way that you know won't leave you out in the cold when those opportunities come along if you could go back in time and give the younger you a piece of advice what would it be I don't know I like just you know this too shall pass Whatever this is, everyone goes through struggles at different times. And, you know, I was uh, lucky to have great friends and family my whole life. And, you know, not everyone is. But um, I think when you do hit hard parts, just knowing that this too will pass and, you know, you can work your way through it as best you can. um, I think that that is always a message everyone can use sometimes. So I think that's what I would say to my younger self is this too will pass. If you had an elevator pitch me your edge covering financial markets. What would you say? Not being afraid to change my view. Um, you know, I like I spent my entire, basically my entire career since 2014 was predicated on the idea that the economy is in great shape and, you know, markets might go down from time to time, but they're not going to fall apart. Um, and then we got a true black swan, um, a true shock um, to the macro economy, uh, you know, with COVID-19 and you know I, I I'm sure I could have reacted to it faster but when it when the writing was on the wall it was like okay we got to change our whole perspective here right now we're going into recession there's nothing that can be done about that that's it um and you know I, I think being able to have that flexibility um you know especially you know I know I know a lot of your your audience is is focused on much shorter time frames than than years or quarters um but whether that's you know Stocks are making a short-term bottom intraday or oil's gotten overstretched or, you know, I just got a bad feeling about the long bond, whatever it is. Um, just being able to make that pivot from I'm long to I'm short or I'm short to I'm long or I'm in the market to I'm flat um, is just incredibly important. Last question for today. What's your favorite thing to do when you're not working? Uh, spending time with my dogs and my uh, fiance. Uh, you know, it's actually kind of nice. We've been using the... Uh, partial lockdown, uh, feel here in Charlotte to, uh, 
force ourselves out of the house is, you know, I, I don't get to go out of the house to go buy lunch or go to the gym in the middle of the day anymore. So we go for walks every night, uh, with the dogs and that's been great. Um, talking about our day and spending time getting a little bit of fresh air while we're maintaining social distancing, of course, and, uh, waggy tails and happy dogs. So, you know, that's, uh, that, that to me is, is probably the best thing to be doing when I'm not uh, in front of my workstation. I don't know what I would be doing right now without my dog. I'm with her nonstop <laughs> taking, taking rides around the neighborhood with her because we walk so much and then I'm literally putting her in the car and driving 10 miles an hour through the neighborhood with the window down with her head out. And I'm just like, <laughs> this is, is she older? Or? No, she's five. But I mean, we walk like, man, well, it's 87 degrees here right now too. And I have a Husky. And so I take oh, her on, geez. I take, my wife takes her on like a two mile walk in the morning. I take her on a two mile walk uh, in the evening and in the middle of the day, it's like shorter walks, but I don't want to burn her out. So uh, I'm like, you know what? Let me come in, throw the air conditioning on and just cruise the neighborhood and we're, <laughs> we're talking to neighbors and she's, she's loving it. And she, you know, she's a five-year-old rescue. We think she's five. Uh, so I, I've had her for about six months and she's just been a blessing during this time to say the least. Uh, you know, so, uh, George, I don't, I don't know what I would do without, without my dogs. No. Honestly. I mean, yeah, that's before I had to spend all day in the house with them. So, you know. <laughs> exactly. yep. Uh, George, where can people find you on Twitter and give us a website to check out? Absolutely. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, my handle is at perks P is in Peter E A R K E S at perks on Twitter. You can also follow bespoke investment groups, Twitter account. That's at B E S P O K E I N V E S T bespoke invest at Twitter or, um, on Twitter. Um, if you want to visit our website, see some of our work that's bespoke premium.com B E S P O K E premium.com, uh, free trials and everything are up there. And we also have a f totally free blog for people to check out. If you want to read about, jobless claims or read about market sentiment, read about what's going on with stocks. Um, you can check out some stuff there. So definitely check that out. And uh, yeah, that's where you can find me. I highly recommend everybody you follow George on Twitter. You're, you're actually one of my very first follows. And I've learned so much from you over the years. Uh, I know it's been, well, gosh, it's almost been four years since you were on the podcast last time. George, let's not keep it. Uh, let, let's not wait that long next time to have you back on. I learned so much from you on Twitter, things, you, pieces you write and, and speaking with you today. Thank you so much for joining me on Futures Radio Show. My pleasure, Anthony. Thank you so much for having me and we'll look forward to doing this again soon. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a review on iTunes. You can listen to all of our episodes on futuresradioshow.com, iTunes, YouTube, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher.